Yeah, thanks for the organizers for inviting me to the seminar. And uh, so I'm excited to share with you uh, my work here at Needleman Lab for the past five years about biophysics of energy metabolism in vivo. So uh, metabolism um, supplies energy uh, for cellular processes. So metabolism constitutes a collection of reactions that converts uh, the energy from the environment to drive uh, different cellular processes. So uh, one of the very important uh, energy cycles inside of the cell is the ATP, ATP cycles. And ATP, known as the energy currency of the cell, that can be produced uh, via uh, several ATP producing pathways, including glycolysis that happens in the uh, cytoplasm of the cell, as well as respiration that happens in this organelle called mitochondria, or uh, usually known as the powerhouse of the cell. Um, so respiration consumes oxygen and uh, to produce ATP. So these are these two very important ATP producing uh, pathways. And then there are a lot of ATP consumers or energy consumers inside of the cell, including protein synthesis, cytoskeleton assembly, uh, iron pumping, so on and so forth. And uh, they uh, use ATP and convert it back to ADP and completing the cycle. So, so, so this is a sort of overview of energy metabolism in the cell. And metabolic activities are characterized, are characterized by the metabolic fluxes of those pathways, which can be um, uh, understood as the uh, rate of turnover of the molecules, such as ATP. And the metabolic activities are dynamic inside of the cells. Uh, for example, these activities of metabolism changes in space and time during processes such as embryo development, which I think is a very interesting um, processes that display a very dynamic uh, behaviors in space and time. And uh, for example, there are temporal variations of metabolism during this process. What you're looking at here is uh, uh, the development of mouse embryo that starts with a matured egg or an oocyte. And uh, um, upon fertilization, we would end up with a one cell embryo and upon several rounds of divisions around day five, we would have a blastocyst. And uh, the metabolism mode switches from a respiration only mode at early stages to a hybrid of both respiration and glycolysis at the blastocyst stage. So this kind of characterizes a temporal variation of metabolism. And uh, there's also spatial variation of metabolism. At the blastocyst stage, uh, the very first cell differentiation event occurs where cells differentiate into two different types of tissues. One is the inner cell mass that would ultimately develop into the embryo. And there is a trophectoderm that would develop into placenta playing a supportive role. And by isolating these two different cell types and measure their oxygen consumption rate, uh, it had been shown that the oxygen consumption rate are different in these two uh, different types of tissues at different places of the embryo showing a potential spatial variation. So the question that I'm very interested in is what are the consequences, causes and consequences of those spatial temporal variations of metabolism uh, during development? For example, what controls metabolic activities in space and time? And uh, how do those metabolic variations impact development across multiple scales? So to address these questions, uh, we need a method to measure metabolic activities with sufficient spatial temporal resolution. And uh, so far techniques um, uh, like this are generally lacking. So that's kind of one of the challenge I'm trying to overcome. And I choose a mature oocyte as a model system to begin with, because at this stage, the mature oocyte or an egg uh, exists in a metabolic steady state, meaning its metabolic activities are constant in time over many hours, so hence make it very convenient for metabolic perturbations. So how do we uh, characterize metabolism? Um, so we actually take advantage of this molecule uh, called NADH, which has a very nice property that it is an autofluorescent biomarker of cell metabolism. It is an electron carrier, and it's, for example, it's central to mitochondrial metabolism where it uh, transfers electrons to uh, oxygen. And in doing so, it helps drive the electron transport chain to uh, pump protons across mitochondrial membrane, and the proton gradient can be utilized to make ATP. Right, so it's a very important metabolic intermediate. And what is cool about this is it is autofluorescent, meaning we don't have to label it and exist in practically um, you know, all types of cells. And so we can just tune the wavelength to the uh, right wavelength for NADH, we can be able to probe its intensity. 
uh, but apparently NADH fluorescence intensity alone is not enough to quantify the metabolism. So we choose actually a more sophisticated fluorescence uh, uh, imaging technique called the fluorescence lifetime image microscopy or FLIM. So this imaging technique, instead of shining a continuous laser, it shines uh, pulsed, very fast pulsed lasers to our sample. And each pulse, in this case, it's called an illumination photon. When it hits the sample, um, it has a probability of exciting um, the fluorophore and the fluorophore can decay and emit another photon. So we can actually use this scale scope to measure the time when the pulse hits the sample called T-pulse. And we can also measure the time when the, uh, when the fluorophore starts to re-emit a photon at a later time, T-photon. And the timing between is called the uh, photon arrival time. And uh, that can be associated to each pulse. For example, we send a train of pulses to our sample. Each pulse are separated by on the time scales of nanoseconds. And some pulses have the probability of ex uh, exciting a photon. And we actually uh, do the single photon counting. We'll be able to uh, build what is called a flame curve that plots the photon counts uh, versus the photon arrival time associated with each of those pulses. And uh, since it's the imaging technique, so we can obtain those flame curves with optical resolution at each pixel. And why this is important? Uh, because this fluorescence imaging technique can be utilized to probe the metabolic state of NADH, called the metabolic imaging of NADH, particularly because NADH can exist in different uh, states. It can be exist in a free state, or it can exist in an enzyme bound state, where it can, uh, for it to transfer uh, electrons or to uh, perform its functions, it has to first bind engage with the enzyme. So it has these two free and enzyme bound states where they display different fluorescence lifetimes. So when they are free, they have a short for us a fluorescence lifetime about 0.4 nanoseconds. When they engage with enzymes, their lifetime uh, get increased to the order of like about two to three nanoseconds. So using flame, we can distinguish these two different pools of NADH, hence probing the enzyme engagement of this important electron carrier. For example, the free NADH would have a certain characteristic flame curve and bound NADH would have another different uh, distinct um, fluorescence decay curve. In cells, NADH is constantly binding and unbinding with enzymes. So we're expecting to see a, a combination of these two pools and hence a com combined combination of this uh, combined flame curve. So we perform such flame imaging on the mouse oocytes, our model system here. And what you're seeing here is uh, just an intensity image of this autofluorescent on ADH. Um, and it, I'm showing you a cross section of this mouse oocyte using this uh, two photon confocal micro, uh, flame microscope. On the right hand side, this is the flame curve that is um, uh, averaged across this whole image. Um, and indeed, you see that there are multiple decay components. There's a fast decay component that corresponds to free NADH and a slow decay component that corresponds to the enzyme bound NADH. And to quantify uh, the, the NADH metabolic state, we actually feed a double exponential function to this decay curve, um, out of which we can obtain the following information. One is the NADH intensity, that just the photon count normalized by the number of pixels. That is related to the concentration of NADH. You can get that out of any ordinary uh, you know, fluorescence uh, um, imaging scope. But what is unique to FLIM is that you can actually get this amplitude of these two double exponentials coming out of the FLIM of the FLIM curve, a free curve that actually quantify the fraction of free and bound NADH. So it separates these two different uh, NADH pools. So those are the parameters to bear in mind, the intensity and fraction of free and bound NADH. Okay, so, um, and also uh, NADH exists in both uh, in different compartments. As you can see here, the actual brighter pixels corresponds to mitochondrial, mitochondria because mitochondria, uh, NADH is enriched in mitochondria as opposed to cytoplasm. They evolve in different pathways. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to segment out the mitochondrial pixels from the cytoplasm pixel such that I'm studying uniquely the mitochondrial metabolic uh, pathways. And this is performed using a machine learning based technique. And we also check that this gives very high accuracy of the segmentation as validated by mitochondrial uh, markers. Okay, so um, now we've established the, the uh, parameters measurable by FLIM. The next question is how sensitive 
uh, the flame parameters to those metabolic variations uh, for mitochondrial uh, metabolism. And for that, we performed the quantitative perturbation of mitochondrial metabolism by uh, dropping oxygen, which is a very important substrate for respiration. And uh, um, so we change continuously the oxygen level inside of the chamber where we culture our uh, oocytes, and we drop that uh, oxygen level um, uh, continuously and uh, slowly uh, from about a 5% of partial pressure to almost 0% hypoxia over a course of about 30 minutes. And we also quickly recover oxygen level. So this is a very reversible perturbation. It's quantitative and reversible. And if we do that, we also do the flame imaging of our mouse oocyte. And we sh I'm showing you here the NADH intensity response. So this is a movie where I'm slowly dropping oxygen. You can see response happens here. And when I recover oxygen, the response is reversible. Okay, so now I'm slowly dropping oxygen and pay attention to the mitochondrial pixels, it brightens up. And when I recover oxygen, it sort of dims back down. So again, when I drop oxygen, it brightens up and it reverses. Okay, so uh, this means this NADH is responding to this metabolic perturbation of oxygen drop. Now, we can actually quantify this uh, response by quantify the NADH intensity, as well as this NADH bound ratio obtained from the flame feeding. NADH bound ratio characterizes the bound NADH divided by free NADH. And these quantities, they vary as a function of oxygen, right? Showing the sensitive uh, response. And now with the calibration, we can uh, convert uh, these quantities into absolute concentrations of the free NADH and enzyme bound NADH inside of the oocyte and, and plot them as a function of oxygen. So, the question is, how are the, these flame uh, measurements, basically free and bound NADH, related to the mitochondrial metabolic activities of specific met, uh, mitochondrial metabolic pathways? So to address this question, uh, we need a model of mitochondrial metabolism to interpret these result, uh, results. So there have been many mathematical models of mitochondrial metabolism developed. Uh, most of them are computational models. Um, they're generally quite complicated because they're established by uh, taking into account of all the known metabolic pathways and the kinetics of all the single enzymes inside the mitochondria. Um, it's usually difficult to measure those model parameters in vivo, right, in living cells. And uh, also different models have been established for different systems. And it's difficult to choose which model to use, for example, for our purpose. So the goal here is, can we develop a core screen model to interpret these flame measurements? And hopefully it's generally applicable to different systems such that we have a microscopy-based technique to be able to uh, you know, predict metabolic activities uh, you know, with optical resolution. Okay, so um, then let's start thinking about a coarse grain description of mitochondrial metabolism. Mitochondria as this organelle that, uh, for example, takes into uh, pyruvate, which is a, a carbon source, and it can oxidize it with the help of oxygen and turn into carbon dioxide and then water. And then it can transduce the free energy from this oxidation event into making ATP. Right? ATP can be utilized by other cellular processes. If we look inside the mitochondria, there are quite a few cycles. There's this NADH cycle, which is basically the molecule we are measuring right now. Uh, it's called a redox cycle because NADH can be oxidized into its oxidized counterpart, NAD, and it can be reduced back to NADH. And this oxidation, can basically the free energy from this oxidation can be used to pump protons uh, across the mitochondrial membrane. So this cycle is coupled to a proton pumping cycle and the proton gradient established out of this proton pumping can be utilized to drive ATP synthesis to make ATP. And of course, some of those protons can also get uh, dissipated without making ATP. This process is not completely efficient. But anyway, so there are these three AT NADH proton ATP cycles coupled together. So that kind of a very uh, intuitive way to think about energy metabolism of mitochondrial respiration. Now, since we're looking at the NA we're measuring NADH, so let's take a closer look at the first redox cycle. So we start modeling this cycle by starting from a very generic ground where we um, model all the potential enzymes inside of this cycle. And the enzymes can be generally categorized into two categories. One is oxidases that oxidize NADH to NAD, oxidation branch. And then there's a reductases that can reduce NAD back to NADH, completing the cycle. And to progress, we actually core screen the model by lumping all the oxidases into one single effective oxidase and all the reductases into one single effective uh, reductase. Um, so this 
core screening is performed uh, rigorously uh, such that all the kinetic parameters can also be core screened into just simple effective kinetic parameters uh, in this core screen model. And now to further progress, we make assumption here that we assume that our system is at a steady state, meaning the concentration of NADH remains more or less constant um, over a time scale much uh, um, longer than those kinetic rates, which is generally true for many cellular processes, including, for example, for OSI, it's definitely a steady state. And even for developing embryos, the development time scale is much longer than those kinetic scales. So it's a sort of a um, pretty uh, um, uh, general assumption. And if we assume that, we can actually further course bring all the uh, kinetics into just two simple kinetic rates one oxidation rate, one reductive rate, okay? So, and now what can we use this model for? Well, we can actually predict a steady state flux of the electron transport chain of the mitochondria using this model. What is electron transport chain flux? It is just the oxidative flux of NADH, right? So it's how fast you are, you are uh, oxidizing NADH to NAD. It's also equivalent to oxygen consumption rate or respiration rate of mitochondria because this process involves oxygen. So I'm going to call this uh, electron transport chain flux or ETC flux from now on, uh, synonymously to respiration rate and oxygen consumption rate. So the model predicts that the ETC flux, or called J-OX, is a simple product of this coarse grain uh, oxidation rate multiplied by the free NADH concentration. And this coarse grain parameter, R-OX, or effective oxidation rate, is further predicted to be proportional to this uh, bound ratio of NADH. So bound NADH divided by free NADH minus its equilibrium counterpart. So how far away is this ratio from its equilibrium characterizes this effective oxidation rate. So it's a pretty remarkable prediction from this coarse grain model. And the, the um, interesting part is that we can actually measure all those concentrations, right? Free and bound NADH using FLIM, as I've already shown you, including free concentration or this bound over free ratio. We can also measure this equilibrium uh, parameter by just driving our system close to equilibrium. For example, by dropping the oxygen, the same experiment I showed you, when it's close to zero oxygen, the system is close to equilibrium. I can read off that parameter as well. So this provides a recipe of predicting the flux of mitochondria, ETC, from the flame measurements, right? So now we just use that and we actually can predict the flux of ETC as a function of oxygen level from our oxygen drop experiment I just showed you. So this is the predicted ETC flux, um, which decreases with oxygen upon a certain threshold. And now to test our model, we check if, uh, uh, you know, to, to test if this prediction is accurate or not, we can actually directly measure the ETC flux by measuring oxygen consumption rates of oocytes. So this is a very neat independent method. And I'm, I'm not gonna go into the details, but the flavor of it is like, you have a very thin capillary where you can put your organism, in this case, maybe a dozen oocytes inside the bottom of the capillary, and it will consume oxygen. Out of reaction diffusion, it will establish the oxygen gradient in this capillary. And now you can use the oxygen sensor to probe this uh, gradient, out of which you can uh, calculate the oxygen consumption rate if you know the diffusivity of oxygen. So uh, by doing that, we actually compare the measured uh, flux with the predict flux, and they agree pretty well without any feeding parameter. All right, so this is, this is a very strong uh, test of our model and showing that it uh, can accurately be used to predict uh, flux from oxygen perturbation. But our model is built upon a, you know, a general terms. It's not just uh, assuming a certain oxygen perturbation. Right? So we expect it to uh, potentially have the predictive power to predict fluxes across different conditions. So we actually tested that by doing other perturbations where we just target different enzymes in the, or processes through this electron transport chain by, for example, increasing the proton leak through the electron transport chain, or we can inhibit a certain enzyme along the complex uh, electron uh, ETC chain, um, or we can also inhibit ATP synthesis, right? All those pharmaceutical perturbations induced uh, significant changes in the ETC flux, which can be accurately predicted uh, from our um, model based on flame of NADH, and that compares pretty nicely with the directly measured OCR. And again, there's no feeding parameter in this procedure. So hence, this test basically showed that our model uh, can actually be used to uh, predict or measure the uh, metabolic fluxes of ETC from flame of NADH.
And what is very cool about this technique is because it's, it's a microscopy based technique. So its power lies in that it, now we can use this to measure or predict metabolic fluxes with subset resolution, which is uh, not uh, uh, you know, uh, available so far by any other techniques. So to, to uh, show this, we actually uh, go back to our single cell and we, instead of average over the whole cell, which is what I showed you so far, I'm gonna go into different regions of the cell and try to predict the fluxes of mitochondria instead of different regions. So I just decide, I just, I just divided the oocytes into those different regions based on the distance towards the cell center or the periphery, however you wanna view it. And uh, then I apply the model uh, but from the flame of ADH actually predicted the ETC flux of mitochondria as a function of distance from the OSI center. And surprisingly, we actually see a gradient of ETC flux um, throughout the OSI. So the intracellular gradient of mitochondrial ETC flux exists in OSI where the mitochondrial flux is higher towards the periphery than the center. And I wanna emphasize that this is not just because of uh, the heterogeneity of the mitochondrial density, because this flux is already normalized by mitochondrial mass. So it's a mitochondrial intrinsic property. It's, it's showing that the mitochondrial is intrinsically different, um, activity is different, uh, you know, close to periphery than towards the center. So now the question is, how do we understand what are the causes um, of this subcellular spatial green ETC on this, uh, in, the, in the mouse oocyte? So now let's go back to those, uh, sort of uh, this coarse grain description of uh, mitochondrial metabolism, where uh, so far I have shown you a predicted this ETC flux, which is basically, again, oxidative NADH flux, right, which is equivalently to oxygen consumption rate because this oxygen is involved in this process. This is what we measured. This process displays this uh, gradient. And this ETC flux can actually be decomposed into two uh, fluxes. One is the proton leak, which uh, is basically proton going uh, leaking through the membrane uh, without making ATP, or um, another part of the flux is actually ATP synthesis. So which is the proton can actually go through ATP synthase and make ATP. So this ETC flux is just basically the sum of these two processes, proton leak plus ATP synthesis. This also demonstrates that mitochondrial respiration is not 100% efficient, right? In terms from the perspective of making ATP, some of those fluxes go through ATP, but some of this just gonna go into heat. Uh, through leak directly. So ETT flux has these two components. And now the question is, um, which one of those are responsible for this gradient? Is that because of the ATP synthesis rate is different or the proton leak is different? So to test that, we can actually inhibit the ATP synthesis pharmaceutically. And if we do that, we can decouple the flux of uh, proton leak from ATP synthesis. And actually we do that, we show, we show that it's actually the gradient still persists when we inhibit a synth ATP synthesis and even got enhanced so this means that this flux gradient is a result of heterogeneous proton leak rather than the ATP synthesis gradient. Okay, so I think this um, have implications, for example, to suggesting there are probably uh, subpopulations of mitochondria dif of different uh, ATP production efficiencies exist in the cell and they kind of arrange spatially in a certain way. Um, okay, so and this is a summary of, uh, of my talk. So number one, I developed a coarse grained NADH redox model that enables the inference of the mitochondrial ETC flux with subcellular, subcellular resolution. And using this technique, I have discovered a spatial gradient of ETC flux in most oocytes where the mitochondria closer to the cell periphery have a higher ETC flux. And this ETC flux gradient is due to an enhanced proton leak of mitochondria closer to the cell periphery. So I think this study, I want to emphasize that kind of uh, provides a proof of principle that can be potentially uh, provides a way to you know, uh, map out metabolic fluxes with subcellular resolution. And it's shown that by like, having that kind of uh, resolution, we can actually um, reveal you know, uh, metabolic gradients or uh, variations with unprecedented resolution. And combining this, um, my kind of future goal is to combine this kind of metabolic variations with the downstream self-organization of uh, uh, several processes or tissue processes during development. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank my uh, lab members from Needleman Lab and our collaborators, and uh, thank you for listening.